Okay, so we're jumping in 4.1, which is just an intro uh, to probability. So um, there's just a handful of terms we want to get through, and then we'll start doing some basic probability problems. And then after that, we're going to make it a little bit more advanced. Okay, so um, to begin, um, we have a um, bunch of terms. So the first term is experiment. An experiment is just essentially a trial where we observe outcomes. So a, a trial could be um, tossing a coin and seeing if it lands heads or tails. Uh, but a trial could also be measuring someone's height. Um, a trial could be uh, just anything where, where you're making an observation. It could be quantitative, like a height, or tossing a coin where the outcome is categorical. Right? There's two types of data, remember, categorical and quantitative. It's some observation you're making. An event is a possible outcome of an experiment. Okay. A simple event is an event that can happen in only one way. I'm going to check something down here. Okay, so I think I have an example. Yeah. All right, so um, let's say the experiment is picking a card from a deck of cards. Pick a card at random. Okay, that's an experiment. And by cards, I mean, on the next page, this is a deck of cards. There are 52 cards. If you pick one randomly, any one of those 50, 52 outcomes is possible. So that's an experiment. Okay. Now, an event is a possible outcome, as I said. So you could pick a heart. Okay. On a deck of cards, these are the hearts I've just circled here. Okay, all of them with little pictures of hearts on them. Okay, or you could pick a queen. That's another event. Okay. Um, as I say, a simple event can happen only in one way. So if I say you've picked a queen, that actually can happen in four ways. And so that's not a simple event. Okay. Or um, picking a heart, that can happen in 13 ways. So that's not a simple event. Those are called compound events. If I say the queen of hearts, that's just this card here. That can only happen in one way. So that's a simple event. All right, so going back, a compound event um, can happen in only one way. Sorry, <laughs> can happen. I'm getting confused. In more than one way. For like a simple event, as I said, you could pick the Queen of Hearts. Okay, but picking just a king um, is a compound event because there are four of these. Sample space is just a list of, of, it's just a collection of all simple events in an experiment.
So this would be like all 52 cards in the deck. That's the sample space. Okay. Any questions about that? So I'm looking to see if any of you have raised your hand or typed anything in the chat box. I've got nothing. So I'm just counting on you guys to weigh in if you have questions. As you can see uh, here, the events are denoted with capital letters, um, A, B, C, or whatever. Um, the probabilities of the events, we put a P around the event. So P of A means the probability of A, this first one. P of B, the probability of B, etc. Okay. Um, for any event, S, the probability must be, to be between zero and one. Any questions about that? Ooh. When you say something can happen in only one way, is that the same as resulting in one data point? Now, so a data point is sort of a variable. Um, this is for Jonathan. A data point is a variable. And it is, it's actually the observation because, sorry, it's, the data point is actually the experiment where there's some observation you're making, which you could call a data point, but there are many outcomes for the data point, the experiment. So um, when I say an event, that's the outcome of the data point, whatever the actual observation is. Now, if you think of the data point as being someone's height, um, um, an event would be that the first person is six feet tall. Exactly. Um, that's a simple event because a person can only be six feet tall one way. But if I say the event is you're be between five and six feet tall, that's something that could happen. It's an event if it happens. But being between five and six feet tall can happen lots of different ways. There are many ways to satisfy that. So that's a compound event. Jonathan, you okay with that? Uh, you can give me a thumbs up. Where'd you go? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Okay. So then going back down, we say any event, the probability has to be between zero and one. And um, we'd say if you use percentages, one is 100% and zero is, of course, 0%. Um, just a couple comments down below here. Probabilities near zero are nearly impossible, but not impossible. Okay. Probabilities equal to zero, that's impossible. Okay. Probabilities near one are nearly certain. and probabilities equal to one are certain. Okay. Then, um, so that's just a quick intro to the ideas. And uh, if we go on to the next page, uh, we're talking about um, the probability of an event. Okay, so this is called the classical approach. It's the most simple of the approaches for computing probability. Um, it says if an event can occur in capital X, single, or sorry, simple ways, and again, you're counting simple outcomes, in an experiment with a total of N outcomes, the probability is X over N. And I'm using a capital X and a capital N. Um, later on, I'll, I'll change the notation for that. Okay, so we'll do examples down below here, but um, the, the idea is like if, you know, the probability of getting a king is four out of 52, um, the event is 
king, but that's a compound event. Getting a king can happen in four simple ways. They are, I'll circle those here. Oops, I'm getting confused. Okay, so you can get a king in four simple ways. So that's the numerator of the probability, four ways. In an experiment with 52 outcomes, so you, you would just say four divided by 52. Okay. Looking for questions about this. It's easiest if we just do some examples. I don't see any hands up, so we're going to keep going. Um, there's a rounding rule here, and this is something you just have to kind of get accustomed to. This basically, you have to keep what we call three significant figures on probabilities. This is for probabilities or percents um, or proportions, which are all really the same for us in this class. Okay, that is, I want you to keep um, three significant figures. Um, when you round, and then I might just say uh, the figures are significant when you don't count leading zeros. So that just means don't count leading zeros. Okay, those aren't part of the measurement. Those are mostly placeholders. Okay, and um, so, you know, I'm just going to do some numbers about this. If you do like point one, two, three, that has three sig figs, we say. Three sig figs, which is easy. But point oh, 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 one, two, three also has three significant figures. Okay, so I want to make sure you guys understand that. So I'm going to pause for a sec and see if there are questions. Professor? Again, you can count the leading zeros. Professor? Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in my chemistry class, we're learning about sig figs also. Hey, buddy. Um, so after, no. if there's not a decimal and a number, so like uh, the number 100, no decimal at the end, that yep. would have one sig fig because the trailing zeros don't have a decimal at the end. Does that apply here as well? Trailing zeros, okay, now the 100 has one significant figure if the 100 is rounded. I think I can, hey, who is that talking? Uh, that was me, Jason. Hey, Jason. I, I, I think what I'll do is say this. In statistics, it's easier than in chemistry because mostly we're worried about numbers after the decimal because I'm only giving this rule for percentages, sorry, for proportions and probabilities, which are always between zero and one. So I don't actually have to worry about numbers in front of the decimal in my rule. Do you follow me? So my, I get to have a rule for significant figures that's consistent with your chemistry teacher, but I don't have to, <laughs> it's really hard um, to understand. And, and this whole, your example is how many significant figures does a hundred have? And I would say it depends. <laughs> it could be a one figure, just the one counts and you don't count the trailing zeros, unless you know that the trailing zeros are not there by rounding. If you know that those two zeros are there because they're precisely measured as part of the number and not because of rounding, then they're all significant figures. So, um, significant okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so it's just way more complicated in chemistry. Here, I just say, just don't count leading zeros. <laughs> and that's that. Okay, does anybody else want to ask about that? Okay, you get you guys. Um, I'm not going to be real, really strict on this, um, but it's better to be careful 
about rounding and don't round too much. I mean, <laughs> a simpler version of this is just don't round too much. Um, the rule is three significant figures. I will do point deductions if you break the rule a lot, but just basically the way I'll do it is if I see you rounding too much, I'll ding you once on an exam, but I won't keep dinging you over and over and over. So you may lose a point for it, um, but I'm not gonna make you lose five points if you've done it five times, okay? But it's sort of, it's, it is important. So um, I wanna make sure we're all kind of aware of this. This is because the idea is um, this, this one that I just wrote up here, if you round this to three places after the decimal, and then I hope this makes sense, um, if you round up to three places after the decimal, it rounds to zero. And now you're telling me that this event, if it's probability, you're telling me the event is, prob is impossible, my bad. <laughs> if you round it to zero, you're saying it's impossible, but it's not. And there's a big difference between unlikely and impossible. Um, and if you think about it in terms of populations, you know, if something has a one hundredth of one percent chance of happening, then that thing will happen to one hundredth of one percent of all people, which will be millions of people. So um, <laughs> small percentages are rare, but they're super important in statistics because we always focus on those really exceptional cases in statistics. So um, we are really interested in these low probabilities, as you'll see. In hypothesis testing, it's always about looking for the low probability events. And those are the ones we call statistically significant. So we're super, super duper careful. Um, okay, so as far as Jonathan, so for something like a percentage, um, yeah, so, um, well, I'd rather change your example, Jonathan, um, and say, look at this one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write on the whiteboard, or the, yeah, the whiteboard again. So, if you have point oh oh no, um, point oh one two three, so that has three significant figures. Um, this would be written as a percentage, as 1.23%. And both of those have three significant figures. So, and the rule applies. You count figures starting at the first non-zero figure. So um, for the 1.23, you start counting at the one. So you don't actually look where the decimal place is with significant figures. You, um, in both cases, you would count those as three sig figs. Okay, um, and I'm zooming in on this thing here on the right. It's a little bit too far to the right. Okay, so you'll count three figures, whether it's in percentage or proportions, but I don't want to go any deeper into this. I, mean, I feel like we're, we're destroying it. We're beating it to death. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do some probabilities. And just so that you guys know, some of you guys are thinking, well, um, can I just write my, an maybe you're thinking, can I write my answers as fractions? Yes. Can I write my answers as, as a number between zero and one? Yes. Can I write it as a percent? Yes. Um, I'm not really asking you to write these in decimal form, and I think it's almost better if you don't sometimes because it just drags it out. These problems aren't that important computationally. They're important theoretically. It's really about the ideas right now. We're not gonna use many of the rules as we go forward, but I need you to understand the basic ideas. Okay, so let's, let's not beat this to death. As you can see, uh, we've got the deck of cards up here. The experiment is to pick one of those 52 cards at random. Um, first example says, let A B card is a heart. Is it simple or compound? Anybody want to pipe in and say or type it in? Getting a heart, is it simple or compound? Good, it's compound because it, you, there's four ways. Remember, compound means it can happen in more than one way. So because it can happen in more than one way, it is simple. Did I say simple? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not trying to confuse you. It's compound. So it can happen in four ways.
Okay, then B card is a queen, simpler compound. Again, this is compound. And uh, you guys wanna correct me on the mistake I made above? How many ways can you get a heart? 13. <laughs> so, oh God, I'm gonna try not to do this. I'm sorry, you guys. 13 ways to get a heart. Yes, that's these guys up there, 13 of them. Um, but um, to get a queen, also compound, there's four ways to do that. Okay. Uh, but then it says A and B, A and B, uh, that's the queen of hearts. How many ways can you do that? Just one way, right? So simple. All right. Any questions? Okay, so now we do these probabilities. So when you look at A, it says the card is a heart. We already said that can happen in 13 ways. So it's 13 out of 52. Somebody type in um, probability of B. This is the probability of getting a queen. And, and write it as a fraction, something divided by something else for probability of B. Yep, four divided by 52. Now, A and B, if you look up above, we already defined what A and B is. That's the queen of hearts. And what, by the way, I notice I'm not reducing my fractions, you guys, I, in this class, almost like it if you don't reduce, I'm not telling you not to reduce your fractions. I am saying, I don't care if you don't reduce your fractions because you almost lose information when you reduce your fractions. When I see four out of 52, it's like, okay, it, happened, it happens four different ways out of 52. If you reduce it, then that information is obscured. So um, I, I'd almost rather you didn't, but I don't care. Okay, so for A and B, people are saying there's only one way out of 52 to get a queen of hearts, as we said. Now, A or B, I wanna see if somebody feels like explaining why it's not, this is wrong. Why is it not 17 out of 52? Okay, there are 13 ways for A to happen. There are four ways for B to happen. Why aren't there 17 ways for A or B to happen? You can unmute yourself or type it in. Well, keep trying. <laughs> okay, I want to. I want to just sort of circle this. A was heart, wasn't it? Or was it queen? A is heart, and there are thirteen of them. So I would count all those. I think Nicholas is good. Yeah, um, Susan, you're you got it. On um, the queen, there are four of those. And um, Susan's saying some ways are duplicated. In fact, the queen of hearts was counted twice if I do 13 plus four. You guys follow on that? Yeah, there's an overlap. Exactly, exactly, Jonathan, way to go. Okay, so um, the 17 out of 52 is wrong. It's 16 out of 52. Okay, um, now there's just a couple of things. So, you know, basically the note I would add on probability of A or B is don't double count anything. Um, then the, the thing to notice about the probability of A and B is um, that these are going to turn into rules. Um, 
uh, or formulas. And I would just say the formulas are important theoretically, but people tend to get them in, get themselves in trouble with these formulas. I just want you to notice um, you've computed probability of A and B using the simplest uh, formula of all, just the ways it can happen, divide by the total number of outcomes. I'm going to show you another way to compute it, but you don't need to do this. And it's almost ridiculous when you do. Um, but probability of A and B, we said, is 1 out of 52, which is, um, if you remember, 52 is 13. Um, it's 4 times 13. Okay, and the reason why I'm doing that is to remember the probability is a fourth. 13 out of 52 is a fourth. And the probability of B is 1 thirteenth. And you're kind of seeing that come up in the probability of A and B. It's a fourth times a thirteenth, which is the probability of A times the probability of B. Oops. So probabilities just do that. It's a strange, interesting thing. And it's not hard to explain why it happens. OK, now um, Yamalef is saying, where does the 52 come from? Yeah, again, there's 52 cards in the deck altogether. So when we do the most basic probability computations, um, you're taking the number of ways a, I think up here it says s, so I won't, I won't say a, I'll say s. The ways s can happen, and you're dividing by the total number of outcomes, okay, so for the deck of cards there's 52 outcomes. Is that okay, Yamalef? She says yes, okay. All right, so anyway, uh, the, the real critical idea is the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, and that'll play out in, for, in some theoretical discussions. <clears throat> the probability of A or B is the 16 out of 52. And if you think about it, I originally said, well, that's really the 13 out of 52, which are um, the hearts plus um, the four out of 52, which were the queens. Now that's an over count, but it's because I've counted the queen of hearts twice, that's 17 out of 52. But then if you subtract out the overlap, which is the one card out of 52 that was counted twice, that's the probability of A and B. You can see that the probability of A or B is just the probability of A, that's the first one, plus the probability of B, that's the second one. But then if there's an overlap, you have to subtract out the probability of A and B, like that. So that's going to be called the addition rule. Any questions about any of that? So I'm going to, these are going to become rules and we're not going to really use them. Okay. So don't, they, they come up once or twice, but they're not very important and it's better if you sort of avoid it when you can. I see somebody's um, highlighting. Does that mean there's a question? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, and I should say, you've got, um, there's a whiteboard, right? So if you go in to annotate on this, you can, especially if you're asking me a question, you can highlight things or draw on this as long as you remember to erase it and you don't. Okay. Going on, we're, we're gonna do, um, and by the way, these are, these are um, theoretical probabilities. If you think about it, there was no real deck of cards here <laughs> and nobody picked a card. Um, and I should say this, um, if, if you could go back to the top of this page, 
where it says x can occur in, sorry, s can occur in x simple ways. Could we make um, a comment here that this requires that all, so let's say this, assumes all simple outcomes are equally likely. Um, that's really important, and I forgot to put it in here. But if you think about the example down here, it says pick a card at random. At random, we've defined that. Random selection means that all outcomes are equally likely. So we're, when I say you're doing this at random, I'm saying you are following the rule that's required so that we can do our computations here. If all outcomes are not equal, like, equally likely, then that's the, the definition of a biased selection, and the bias is selection bias. Um, but all of statistics assumes that selection is random. And if selection is random, then we can compute probabilities based on this discussion that we're having right now. If things aren't random, then you can't do anything with probability. Um, so pick a card at random. So this, uh, again, is assuming all outcomes are equally likely. Then I just pause and see if there's any questions. Okay, so again, that whole approach was called um, the classic approach. And it's not an approximation for probability. Those are exact probabilities as long as when you're doing your selections that they're random. Um, if you have true randomness, then this method works. Um, the problem is that lots of times things aren't truly random. Um, you know, if I say pick a person at random, um, what's the probability um, that the person is a female? And that's complicated because there's actually more females on the planet then there are males or other gendered people as well. Female people um, live longer, and so they're slightly more probable if you pick one random. So you can't just assume it's a 50-50 outcome. Um, so so this, this, this thing of all simple outcomes are equally likely, um, it's a pretty complicated uh, statement, and, and, and lots of times it just doesn't work. Uh, a simpler example is I say flip a coin. You know, what's the probability that it lands heads? Well, I would like to say there's one way to get heads out of two outcomes, but uh, I don't know that heads and tails are equally likely. So I can't say the probability is 50% exactly unless I'm certain the outcomes are equally likely. And I see a, a comment down here. It says uh, from Susan, in this example, would a bias selection be a deck of cards with all the spades removed? Um, no, I think on that one, um, a bias selection, you see if you remove the spades, all you're doing is you're limiting the sample space. So the outcomes, I mean, you, you could say if you tell somebody, um, no, I'm gonna actually change my answer. <laughs> if you tell somebody um, that all 52 cards are there, but the spades are removed, um, then the probability of spades is going to be reduced to zero. And if they think the spades are there, then the probability of the spade is now lower than the probability of the other outcomes. So you don't have a random selection if you're talking about the entire deck. So I think that's pretty good, Susan. I'm going to agree with you. Um, and then the other thing I think I'd say um, is another way to do a biased 
um, selection from a deck of cards is to not shuffle the cards. So you could put anything you want on the top of the deck. And then if you just ask someone to pick a card from the top of the deck, then obviously that's not a random selection if it's not shuffled and you don't let them pick anything they want. So, so then the probability, you know, let's say the, the card on top is a queen of hearts, um, then the probability of a queen of hearts is 100%. If, and that's introducing bias. So that's not random. You kind of need to shuffle the deck and you kind of need to allow people to pick any card they want. And then that's a random selection. Any questions, anybody? Is Susan, you okay with all that? Awesome. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and um, do our probability experiment now. So, um, and this is gonna be for all of us. So I'm gonna go back to Canvas real quick and point to this page. Actually, I can do, that, do it this way. So um, we're, the, the web page is, um, it's got with one T, and it's not me, it's my office partner <laughs> who did this for me. It's got childress.com slash uh, games slash, and the game is called Porkability, which is just hilarious. So he called it Porkability. Like that. And obviously, that's how you spell porkability. Even though it's not a word, it has the correct spelling. Okay, so if you can get to that, um, I'm going to give you a second. And if you're not able to do this, I understand. Uh, Susan Faith, you have your hand up. Um, I'm guessing that's from before. But if you have a, <laughs> she'll fix it. Okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so the Porkability app, I'm gonna stop the share here real quick. And, uh, and as again, see the, the, what I was supposed to do is bring these little pigs to class, but the pigs are um, carriers of the coronavirus, as you know. So the pigs are in quarantine, they're being, they're being it's not self-quarantine, I'm, I'm forcibly quarantining the pigs. They're filthy, they're absolutely filthy. So we have to use virtual pigs. So um, I'm gonna go to my, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen for porkability real quick here. Okay, so I hope you guys can see that. And I'm also, once again, trying to find my chat. This keeps happening to me. There it is. Okay. All right, so um, basically the pig dice, actually, <laughs> the pigs are dice and they, when you roll them, they land in six positions. And the positions are here on the screen, side, <laughs> left side, right side, on their back. That's what we're gonna be counting here when the pig lands on its back, that's gonna be considered a success. Um, the trotter is just when he lands on his feet and that does happen. I think it's a she though, if you look very closely, I apologize. Um, snouter, they can actually do sort of a headstand for the snouter and the leading jowler is a miracle when it happens. The pig is on, on one foot 
a nose and an ear. It's a joy when it happens. Okay, now if you scroll down here, um, I want you to toss your pig 25 times. So you just tap and it records the outcomes. This one landed on, my first one landed on its back. Next one, again on the back. This one's a trotter, it's on its feet. You just keep tossing. So fill that up for 25 outcomes. These are random. <laughs> and the applet is respecting the true probabilities. And when I say true probabilities, um, I think the probabilities depend on the individual pig. And um, every pig is different, as you know. And so the probability the pig lands on its back sort of depends on the pig. And sometimes you're gonna get loads and loads. I mean, see, the, if you look, I got one, two, three, four, where it landed on its back. If I do it again, one, two, three, oh my Lord, one, two, three, four, five. I got five that time. So last time I did it, I got eight. I actually did it two times in a row and I got eight. So it's sort of, you know, you, it's random. Um, but in the long run, yeah, you gotta lean. Congratulations, Jason. Wow, that's terrific. If I had money, I would give it to you. I actually do have money, but I can't personally give it to you right now. So um, anyway, so you get these outcomes, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, we've got these outcomes. And what I want you to do real quick is to go back to the handout. So now I'm going to do a new share. Of my iPad. Okay, and then what you're going to do is just write yes or no for the 25 trials. Yes means the pig land on, landed on its back. A success is the pig landed on its back here. So I want you to go back, look at your trials, write yes if the pig landed on its back, write no if it didn't. You can just fill up the table for your little piggy, and every pig's different, as you know, as I've said. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, put in my results, just sort of quietly here. Okay, so I've got mine in. Okay. Trying to find my screen. <laughs> okay, so I've got mine in. And what you wanna do is count up um, how many successes you had at a given trial. So. Um, and, and these should accumulate. So um, on trial one, I had a zero because I didn't get anything. On trial two, I still have a zero because I still haven't gotten it to land on this back. And you would only increment this when you get a yes. So on trial seven, I had a yes. So now I've had one success. I got another yes, so I increment. Now I have two successes. I get another yes, now I have three successes. And then the no's start coming again. So I'm still stuck at three successes for some time. 
There's a yes on trial 18, so I'm up at four. And no successes, so I'm stuck at four. To trial 24, where I'm at my fifth success. And that's all I got. So do yours something like that. Just increment when you see a yes. Now, the relative frequencies are the successes divided by the number of trials. So let's go ahead for relative frequency. I'll define that here. It's, it's the number of successes divided by the trial, number of trials. I'm wondering, do I need to, hey, do you guys want more time? Would you type, would you chat a yes if you need more time? So I'm gonna say that nobody needs more time. Okay, so um, with relative frequencies, you're taking number of successes divided by number of trials. You're, the number of successes, um, is in the third column of the table. I've highlighted that with the green highlight. And the number of trials I'll highlight with blue, blue, blue. So there was zero out of one on the first roll. So the first proportion is zero out of one. That's a relative frequency. And then zero out of two. And this just goes on, zero out of three and so on. Finally, on the seventh trial, I get to say there was one success out of seven, then two out of eight on the eighth trial, three out of nine on the third. So you're dividing Um, in every case, um, the number in, in the third column by the number in the first column. Okay, I'm looking to see if anybody has questions. Okay, so just go ahead and finish this. Yeah, no, we're gonna divide these. So get your, you wanna get your calculator out. Normally I would say three significant figures, but right now just do two places after the decimal because we have to graph these in a sec. So, um, you know, the beginning is really easy. On the first one, you're either gonna have a zero or a one. So some of you guys are gonna have a one. So for zero divided by one, that's just zero and so on.
So then we're going to do a graph after this. And I'm just copying my numbers over because I can't see them on my iPad. So I'm just going to um, graph these and cross them off as I get to them. Um, just a couple of points here. Um, start at one, not zero on the horizontal axis. So the one here, don't, don't graph anything for the zero. One, two, I'll just put the odds in to make it easier to see. Okay, so got all my trials in. Again, don't start at zero. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions. Perfect. Okay. So I get a bunch of zeros till, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seventh trial, I got 14%. Then eighth, 25%. Ninth, 33%. It's not really necessary to make this into sort of like one of these stock market graphs, sort of a time series. Um, I'm going to do this just to kill time so that people can catch up. But the dots are sufficient. Okay, I'm looking to see if anybody has questions. I think I can get rid of all that. I don't know the probability that the pig lands on its back, but I've got a sense of it right now. You guys all good? Maybe give me a thumbs up if you're ready to go or a green check mark if you're ready to go. Thumbs down. I'm going to give Andrea a second. <laughs> Wait, now your thumbs down is gone. I'm just gonna wait another second, you guys. Sneezing is good.
And again, all you, all you guys, I'm just waiting for either a thumbs up or a check mark. When you're ready, you can um, finish and then post one of those when you're ready. It's almost break time, so we'll be doing a normal break in a little bit. All right, um, if you need more time, will you type that as a message? I'm happy to give you more time. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead then. Um, now when it says here, what's the probability that the pig lands on its back? What do you think? Are we gonna be estimating this or do we know the probability? Go ahead and answer what you think the probability is right here for the pig landing on its back. Now to me, I if somebody asked me, now you, some of you guys probably got in the 30% range. Um, I got close to 20%. Last time I did this, I got 32%. Okay. Um, but today, I'm closer to 20%. I actually feel better about the 20%. So I, I'm just going to guess and say around um, 0.20, because that's the last relative frequency I got way up here in the table. I got 20% toward the end. And that seemed to be sort of stabilizing. And the real thing that you want to notice here is just the way the probabilities sort of are, they vary a lot in the beginning, but they stabilize over time. And that's what you're looking at when you look at these graphs is the law of large numbers, which just says um, that these will stabilize if you can get more trials in. So I'm guessing around 20% because that's what my last figure, but you guys might have different ideas about this. So put down whatever you like, but I'm gonna say 20%. Now, um, anybody wanna type, oh, Susan got 16. Anybody wanna type in whether you think this is exact or an estimate? Yeah, everybody's right, this is an estimate. Oops. Then tell me how you would be more precise in this. If it's just an estimate, how would you make it better? More trials, correct. So that's sort of intuitive and, and people kind of get that usually. That's the law of large numbers. So, um, as the number of trials increases, um, the relative frequency of an event approaches the true probability
And then I might say um, that um, we will never really know exactly the, exactly the true probability. Actually, I'll leave it out. But generally speaking, um, whenever you use try, uh, relative frequencies to estimate a probability, it's always just an estimate. Okay, so going back up, um, I don't think I feel, did I feel everything in here? Yeah, skip something. So go back to the previous page. Okay, so it says estimating probabilities using relative frequencies here. And it says if we conduct an experiment n times and event s occurs x times, then the probability of success is just x over n. Okay, and again, that's called a relative frequency. And it's just an approximate probability. And unfortunately in statistics, we never know true probabilities. So we're always looking for ways to sort of just approximate them. Okay. You're pretty good here. All right, um, this is a good time for a break. So um, we'll start with 4.2. Let, let's take a break till what time is it? 9.52. So we're going to do a break till 10.02. And I'm going to stop my recording. Okay, so we're going to jump into section 4.2. Um, there's a list of formulas that come up in this section. And um, so real quick, I uh, want to kind of just make a, a comment about the formulas. Um, and you've already seen some of them, but I would just say avoid using the formulas. <laughs> Um, when uh, the answer can just be given as a simple fraction. And, you know, like probability of S is equal to x over n. That, those kinds of questions um, don't need these complicated formulas that I'm about to put together with you guys. So um, let's just go ahead and jump into them. They are important for theoretical reasons, uh, but they don't um, get used much. Um, but I'll show you. I'll show you. So dependent events, um, a and b are dependent. Um, if um, the probability of one depends on the occurrence of the other. And we'll do an example, but uh, just for simply, um, people don't like the fact that um, that males under 25 
get charged more for uh, car insurance um, <laughs> because you know, it just seems unfair. Uh, but the reason why it's allowed is because being, I should say your gender and the risk of a car accident, those are dependent events, which is to say, um, if you're male, the probability of a car accident is higher, a male under 25, I guess, based on the insurance companies, the probability is higher if you're that male, but the probability goes down if you're a female. So the probability of one depends on the occurrence of the other, that the other being your gender, um, that changes the probability. So uh, <laughs> all of that is to say that those two events are dependent. So any questions about that? All right, and then the next thing is uh, conditional probabilities. When I say the probability, oops, when I say P of B with a vertical line and an A, that is not really a mathematical, that vertical line isn't a division or anything like this. This is the probability that, this is the probability of B given that A has occurred. The probability of B given A has occurred. We need that because if A and B are dependent events, then the probability of B depends on whether A has happened. So sometimes when you do uh, probabilities, you need to make assumptions about which, you know, you know what's the condition here, uh, what's happened, uh, because sometimes the conditions affect the probabilities, which are called conditional probabilities. Any questions about that? Um, and we'll do examples in a second, but the multiplication rule that we showed, and I'll just slide back here a couple of pages back. Um, this statement here, um, when we said the probability of A is equal to the probability of A, sorry, the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. That's the um, multiplication rule, but it's only, it only works for independent events. It's a little different for dependent events. So for independent events, the probability of A and B is, as we said, probability of A times the probability of B. Just works. Okay? And if you want to look at the book, there's a kind of an explanation of, of why it works. For dependent events, you just have to assume that they're both happening. So when I do the probability of A and B, A and B means both A and B are happening. So you would just use the multiplication rule, probability of A, but then when you do the probability of B, these are dependent events. So the probability of B depends on whether A is happening or not. But a and B means they're both happening. So when you do the probability of B, you should assume that A is also happening because we need them both to happen for this event to occur. So you do the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Now this is easier than it sounds, um, but just really quickly, um, what's the probability, if you toss two fair coins, What's the probability that they're both heads? Well, first of all, the probability of heads, we're gonna assume is 0.50. That's just an assumption. And I would imagine that it might be possible to make a coin that's biased, but these are fair coins. So I think fair means that it's a 50-50 proposition. So I can say the probability of heads is 50%. And then the probability of two heads would be a head and a head, remember you're tossing two coins. So you ought to be able to just do the probability of heads times the probability of heads. And so that's 0 0.50 times 0 0.50. And I think that's 0 0.25. Any questions about that?
<clears throat> now the next problem is a little more complicated. We're picking two cards from the deck of 52, but it says without replacement. So that just means you're not putting the first card back as you draw the second. So the conditions change with the second card. The deck is missing a card. So there are different outcomes possible now. So it says, what's the probability that they're both hearts? Okay, so this is the probability of H and H here. Um, <laughs> I better distinguish. Um, up above, H stood for heads, obviously. Uh, and now H here stands for hearts. Okay, so the probability of H and H, um, oh boy, the notation's gonna kill me here. Um, let's uh, back off on this. Um, let's have an A and a B. So A will be, first card is a heart, And B will be second card is a heart. Okay, I get different um, cards, so I don't want to use the same letter for both of them. Okay, so probability of A and B would be the probability of A times the probability of B. And the question is, are these independent events or dependent events? That would be dependent if the probability of the second card being hard depends on what happened with the first card. So the question is, do you think these are independent or dependent? Go ahead and type your answer in. I got lots of people saying dependent, and that is true. The probability that the second card is a heart depends on how many hearts are left in the deck. So with the first probability, there is a total of 52 cards, okay? But how many hearts are in the deck? Anybody? Right, there's 13 hearts times. Now, remember, you're not replacing that card. So for the second card, how many outcomes are there? The denominator is now 51. So things are changing on the second draw. Okay, any questions? Now, the question is how many hearts are in the deck? And and again, this is why it's dependent. The number of hearts in the deck depends, got that? It depends, and that's why it's dependent on what happened with the first card. So you're supposed to assume that both of these are happening, and the probability of B is the wrong notation up here. I should say the probability of B given A, because it depends. What's the probability that the second card is a heart given that the first card was a heart. Ah, so now I know how many hearts are in the deck. How many? Right, 12 hearts left now. Any questions there? Now, as I said, I mean, obviously you're gonna to have to simplify this somehow. So, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do a little bit of reducing. So, um, Let's see, um, 13 goes into itself once and into 52 uh, four times. And three goes into 12 four times and three times 17 is 51. And then there's a couple of fours I can cancel. Like that, so it looks like it's just one out of 17. <laughs> And that's the probability. Okay, and again, you don't have to write this in a decimal form. Um, okay, great job, everybody. Any questions about this one? That's a little trickier.
And it, again, it's important for theoretical reasons. There's not really a better way to do the problem. You kind of have to use the formula on this one. Okay, any questions? All right, let's slide on down. A couple more rules here. First of all, mutually exclusive events has to be defined. So A and B are mutually exclusive. If they can't both happen in the experiment. I'll say in one experiment. Whatever your experiment is. So <clears throat> um, the, the addition rule for events that are not mutually exclusive, I'm going to go ahead and slide back again. And we already kind of figured this out when we were talking in the very beginning down here, uh, where we said the probability of A or B turns out to be the probability of A plus, uh, sorry, plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. So that's the addition rule, easy enough. So we'll just copy that down. So if the events are not mutually exclusive, that means they can both happen. The probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. So you have to subtract out that overlap where both A and B can happen so you don't double count it. Okay. Um, and, and we've done the example of that. For events that are mutually exclusive, um, mutually exclusive just means they can't both happen. So the probability of A and B would be zero if they're mutually exclusive. So the probability of A or B would just be the probability of A plus the probability of B. And this is the one we use mostly. Um, we add probabilities as long as those events are mutually exclusive. And we do this a lot in statistics. Any questions? Okay, um, looking for questions. We don't use um, the mutually, the not mutually exclusive one much. I'll put a star. This one for the mutually exclusive events, that comes up a lot. Okay, want to keep going? Uh, any questions real quick? And again, if you can use your mic to talk, you can interrupt me anytime or type a question down. Oh. I mean, I explain the formula again. Do you mean the one that I put a star next to? I see, um, Susan, what if I went back and reminded you of what we were doing here, right here. So going back to um, several pages back, um, we had said that you're picking a card from a deck and A is that the card is a heart. B was that the card is a queen. Okay. And way down at the bottom of the page, we said, what's the probability of A or B? That means the card is a heart or a queen. And what we figured out was that you could do the probability of a heart, which was there's 13 hearts in the deck, plus the probability of a queen. There were four of those, so the probability is four out of 52. And recognizing the 13 plus the four is 17. You've done a double, double count of the queen of hearts because it's a heart and it's a queen, okay? So you have to subtract out that one card that is both A and B, a heart and a queen. So when you add the hearts plus the queens, you get 17 minus the one queen of hearts, you end up with 16 out of 52 because there's only 16 cards when you talk about hearts and queens, not 17. Okay, so Susan, does that help? Oh, 
or um, and you're not telling me so. Don't know what that means exactly. Nothing. Right. Okay, so we're going to do an example of the formula again. So, um, so this part right here, sorry, do you mean this formula here that I'm highlighting? So just to read it, it says P of A or B. That's the probability of either A or B happening, one or the other, not necessarily both. Okay, That's the probability of A. That's this in the areas real quick here. Probability of A is this part. Okay, Probability of B is that part. You have to add the individual probabilities and then subtract the probability that they both happen. Okay. Probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Okay, so um, you were going to do an example of this and hopefully this will help a little bit. This one, um, this example uh, puts a lot of different ideas together. You're tossing two unbiased coins. We want to know the probability that exactly one is heads. So, um, We'll just go ahead and do H for heads, T for tails, and the coin is unbiased. So the probability of heads is 0.5, 50%. You can put a zero after that. That's 50% if you like. Probability of tails is also 0.5 or 50%. Okay. So when they say probability of exactly one head, you're tossing two coins. Maybe you're thinking, oh, it's gotta be 50%. And it will be, but let's see why. Probability of getting one head is that you could do a head and a tail, but you could also do a tail and a head. Now you have to think of those as two separate things. If you get a head and a tail, that's one way to get one head. But if you turn the coins over, both of them, you'll have a tail and a head, which is a completely different toss. And it's another way to get one head. So there's actually two ways to do that. And um, so that's why, why we have to list them both. Now, or, and by the way, these are mutually exclusive. You can't have both of these happening. Either you get a head and a tail or a tail and a head. Either one will work, so there's the or, and then you do um, the additional. You could get a head and a tail. Or means add, so plus the probability of a tail and a head, like that. And then and means multiply, so this would be the probability of a head times the probability of a tail plus the probability of a tail times the probability of a head. Okay. All of the individual probabilities are 50%. So this is 0.5 times 0.5 plus 0.5 times 0.5. Um, 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. So this adds up to 0.25 plus 0.25. And of course, that's 0.50, 50%. So if you were guessing, oh, that's got to be 50%, it is. But this is actually more complicated than you think. And sometimes when you guess these things, you get it wrong. So you have to be able to prove that it's 50%. And that's how you would do it. Any questions about that one? Okay, and then complements, um, this is a little bit easier. So if A, let's, let me write this out here. So if A is any event, um, the 
a complement of A. That's with an E, not an I. The complement of A denoted on an A with a bar over it is the event not A. So um, you could pick a card, maybe um, the event is the card is a heart. And the complement is just that the card is not a heart. And there's different ways to say that. If it's not a heart, then it's a spade or a club or a diamond. Um, but it's not a heart. Okay, any questions? Oh, um, Brian, I'm so sorry. What part? Uh, this is difficult. I'm assuming you can't unmute yourself because you don't have a mic. So Brian Kwan's asking, can I explain the unbiased coins again? Do you mean just what it means to be unbiased? Just the whole problem? Okay. Um, right, so first of all, the coin, you're, you're dropping two coins. They're unbiased, which means they have a 50% chance of being heads and 50% for being tails, so they're 50-50. Um, the probability of one head here, um, well, you can get one head in two different ways. You could get a head on the first coin and a tail on the second, or you could get a tail on the first and a head on the second. Either way, you end up with one head. Any questions? Head and tail or tail and head, those are different tosses on the coin. Okay, and then the or in that statement, head and tail or tail and head, or is the addition rule, probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. So the or becomes a plus sign, you're adding. And then the multiplication rule says that the and becomes a multiply. So heads, probability of head and tail is the probability of head times the probability of tail. There's the plus for the or, and then another multiplication for tails and heads. Multiply it all out, and you get 50%. Okay. So then going on um, for complements again, A complement is an A with a bar over it, and that just means not A. And just a little bit of a note here, that if you do the probability of A or A complement, I'm gonna write it this way. One is the probability of A or A complement. All that is saying is that either event, an event happens or it doesn't. One of those has to happen. So when I say that the probability is one, I'm saying it's 100%, it's a certainty, it must happen. Now you can break this up with the or and just say, well, these are mutually exclusive. So the probability of A or A complement is the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. So those two probabilities add up to one. And if there's a 25% chance of rain today, the chance that it doesn't rain, well, they have to add up to one. So 25% chance is 0.25. The complement of that is 0.75, those add up to one. Probability that it doesn't rain is 75% chance. Okay, so um, rule of complements just takes this statement um, that I wrote here that the probability of A plus the probability of A complement um, has to be one. Okay, and you can solve either one of these this way. You could say that the probability of A is one minus the probability of A complement, and, or <laughs> you could say the probability of A complement is one minus the probability of A. Okay, so those are really the same statement. And as I said, um, if 
Um, a stands for rain today. Oops. And um, the probability of A is 0.25, then a complement would be no rain today. And the probability of A complement is one minus the probability of A. So this is one minus 0.25, and that's 0.75, which is 75% chance. And I think that's sort of common sense. I would expect um, all of you, if I said there was a 25% chance of rain, I'd expect all you guys would say, oh, that means there's a 75% chance that there's no rain. Okay, is there any question about that? Just want to give you guys a chance to pipe in. So the rule of complements is what this is called. And um, it's sort of common sense and we use it a lot. So um, you'll just see it coming up a lot, especially as we move forward in the next few chapters. I want to verify, are you guys able to see the full um, iPad screen? From left to right? That's a yes. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, now I want to go into the next example. So um, this one's a sort of a combination of all the different examples that we've done. And it's kind of hard. Um, don't really care about questions like this, but there's some in the book, so I better do one. Um, it says 10% of a batch of 15 amp fuses is defective. It says if we pick five at random with replacement, which means we're going to keep putting them back before we test the next one, what's the probability that at least one of the fuses is defective? Okay, 10% are defective. So couple of things to say about this. Um, let's go ahead and say um, D stands for defective. Okay, and so D bar is the complement, which you just put a not D. So in this case, not defective. Now it's given that the probability of a defective fuse is, well, 10% of them are defective, so the proportion is the probability. So this would be also 10%, 0.10. Any questions? Just look in here. Okay, and then not defective, that's a complement. So the probability of a non-defective fuse would be one minus the probability of a defective fuse. So this would be one minus 0.10, and of course you're thinking 90%, and that is sort of common sense. Okay, now the, that's not the question though. The question is, what's the probability that at least one is defective? I want to go ahead and make a note up above here for the rule of complements. Um, if event A is complicated, um, maybe a complement is easier. Then the probability of A is one minus the probability of A complement. Now that would be an advantage if A complement is an easy event. 
and A is hard. So this one, I would say, if you look at the event where we're at, the question we're asked here, um, it says um, the probability that at least one fuse is detected out of five. So A is going to be the event at least one fuse is detected. Okay. Um, and I would say that's complicated. Okay, so if an event's complicated, think about the opposite. So a complement, how many would be defective in that case? I'll wait for you to someone to type it in. So it's not true that at least one is defective. So how many are defective? Not at least one means how many? Zero, correct. Thank you, Susan. So a complement is none are defective. Now that's actually super easy. That can only happen in one way, where at least one could be one, two, three, four, or five that would be defective. That can happen in five ways. The complement can only happen in one way. So this is a perfect example. Just sometimes the complement can happen in fewer ways. So the probabilities are less complicated. And that's why you would use this. So the probability of A is what you're asked here. But this is one minus the probability of A complement, which is easier. Okay. Now I'm going to kind of put this down here. One minus the probability of what? Well, what is a complement? None are defective. So you've got to get a non-defective fuse five times. So see if this makes sense. Probability of decomplement and decomplement and decomplement and decomplement and that's one, two, three, four. Last one, decomplement. All five fuses are non-defective. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, then the only question is, what's the probability of not being defective? I can just multiply these. Individual probabilities, remember and means multiply. So I'm gonna multiply five probabilities and I need to know whether the events are independent or dependent. I would just make one statement here. It says the five fuses are selected with replacement. So does the probability change from trial to trial or does it stay 10% if you're replacing? Get somebody right. Either the probabilities change, you could just say they change or they don't change. And, and I mean, from trial to trial, Wendy says that the probabilities don't change because, yeah, right guys, because you keep putting the fuse back every time you test it, still you will always have 10% defective. So the probability of a non-defective fuse stays at 90% throughout which means all of these are going to be 90%. So we're just going to keep putting in a 0.90. You don't have to put 90, you can just say 0.9. Okay, and on your calculator, you would just do 1 minus 0.9 to the fifth. Now I'm going to. Um, on your calculator, you have a X to the blank button. So I don't know, it's hard to show calculate. Ooh, I could do this. Um, so just real quickly, um, I'm gonna go to my camera and make sure you, sure you guys are with me here on using weird exponents. So turning on, clearing my screen. Um, so it was one and then minus I'm going to type a 0.9 and the, the exponent button I'm pointing at right now. So 
to the, and again, it's the fifth power. So I'll press the five, one minus 0.9 to the fifth, 0.40951 is the probability. So this is 0 0.40951. And if you were to round that to three significant figures, um, that five makes the nine go up. So you're going to do 0 0.410. That's three significant figures. Um, you can say 41.0%. Okay. The zero is there to tell you, hey, I didn't round that. We know it, it, that's a known figure. It's a zero. Okay. Tough problem. I don't usually do something as hard as that on an exam. Um, obviously, it's not horribly hard, but it's a little tricky. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a chance to ask a question. I'm just going to pause. And that's really about as hard as these get. Okay, uh, looks like we're, we don't have any questions. You guys okay to move on? Just say wait if you need me to wait. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> Susan, tell me when I can go. Um, do you want to see me do that on the calculator again? Or do you just want me to explain why we did it? Okay. Um, so, you know, anytime you need something to happen multiple times, you have to multiply the probability. So multiple times means multiple probabilities. Okay, we need it. Remember when we say none are defective, uh, that and just remember not defective is a D with a bar over it. Okay, and we needed that to happen five times because there are five fuses. So you can see I'm saying that the first fuse is not defective, the second's not defective, the third's not defective, the fourth and the fifth are not defective. And every time I say, one of these multiple events. If I need them all to happen, then I need to multiply that probability to get the, all of those probabilities to get my final answer. Every one of these fuses that's not defective had a 90% a chance. So I have to multiply 0 0.90 five times together because it needs to happen five times. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions? You got it? Okay, terrific. Okay, so um, we're gonna go to the next uh, section in the book. So this is section 5.1, we're moving into chapter five. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I skipped to chapter three, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, we skipped chapter three and um, that's just because uh, it, it works better if we do it at the same time as chapter 10. So we're going to go all the way through chapter 9 and then we'll go back to chapter 3. It's not, it's not that we're completely skipping it, but we're skipping it from now. Okay, so we, did, we finished chapter 2, then we did 4 today, and now we're going into 5. And there's, all, there's also only like two sections in chapter 5. Let me see how much of this we can get through today. Okay, so on 5.1 it says, now we examine probability experiments where the outcome of a particular value of a quantity is, sorry, the outcome is 
a particular outcome of a quantitative variable. So basically, the, the uh, outcomes are always a number, and the number is always a quantity. Okay, and you'll see an example here. The, the variable is always denoted by an x, but sometimes, I said always, usually an x, it represents all possible outcomes for a random trial or an observation. Um, the probability of observing a particular value of x is denoted p of x down here. Okay, any questions? Um, now, for a discrete random variable, this is one whose values are discrete. We talked about discrete uh, values. Um, they're ones that you can count, uh, a, a variable whose values you can count or at least list in order. So discrete ra random variable, um, the values can be counted. or listed um, because there are gaps between possible values. Yeah, so for example, um, the x could take on values um, of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Each of those values has a gap between 1 and the next. So between 1 and 2, there's no, valuable, no value that is possible for this variable because it's something you're counting. So if, if you're counting you know, the number of people, there's not going to be one and a half people. Um, so those are, those are um, gaps between possible values. And then the probability distribution is where for each value of x, um, we associate a probability. which would be p of x. Okay, and so you can see down below on the handout that there's a table where I'm gonna have a bunch of different values for x, and then I'm gonna figure out the probabilities for every outcome. There's a couple other columns that we'll fill in later, um, but we're just going to um, build a probability distribution. So the example, and again, um, probability distribution is where you associate for each value of the variable a probability. So when you toss four coins, we're going to rep let x represent the number of coins that land heads. Okay. Now remember, a sample space is just a list of all the outcomes. So let's see here. You could get zero heads, so that would be four tails. Okay. You could get one head. That could be H T T T or tail head head uh, <laughs> tail head tail tail or tail tail head tail or tail 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 head. So all of those are with one head. I'm gonna kind of highlight those together. Okay. You could get two heads, so you get H H E T or head tail head tail or um, head tail tail head or um, tail head tail head. And all the different ways you can get two heads. Or um, tail, tail, oops, head, head. Um, you guys, there's one more way to get two heads. 
that I missed. Can you see it? Did somebody type it? I missed one of the ways to get two heads. Tail, head, head, tail. Thank you, Jason. Correct. Okay, so these guys all go together. I'm going to highlight them with a different color. Those all have two heads. Let's do three heads. So you could get the first three as heads and then a tail, or the tail could occur on any of these outcomes. So you could do head, head, tail, head, or head, tail, head, head, or the first could be the tail, tail, head, head, head. So that's with three heads. There are no other ways to get three heads. So I'll have those separately. And what's the last thing that I need to list here, just uh, in terms of heads and tails? All heads. So the very last one is H, 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 like that. Okay, so now my random variable x is the number of heads. Okay, so down in the table here, I want to list all the values for x. What's the first lowest value for x? Again, x is the number of heads. What's the lowest value for x? Zero, correct. You could get zero, one head, two, three, or four heads. Okay. Now the probabilities. First of all, what's the total number of outcomes when you toss four coins? Each one of those outcomes up above is one of those total of the outcomes. What's the total number of outcomes? I don't mean individually. I mean the tail, 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 tail is one outcome. Yeah, there's 16 outcomes, Andrea. Thank you. Total outcomes are 16. So what's the probability of getting a zero heads? One out of, remember probabilities, you have to divide. One divided by 16, I think, yeah. Good, so I'm gonna put in the probabilities. So there's only one way to get zero heads out of 16. Um, what's the probability of one head? Yeah, four. But you got to say four divided by 16, which is one fourth, correct? But I'm going to leave it as four sixteenths. Two heads, I think, is six sixteenths. Okay. Three heads goes back down now, four sixteenths. And four heads, there's only one way to do it, so that's down to one sixteenth. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Does anybody want me to explain this better? Now, when you list all the probabilities, um, you're describing how the probability is distributed among the outcomes. So again, that's a probability distribution. What do you think those probabilities add up to, anybody?
Yeah, 16 out of 16, which is one. Oops. So the total is 16 out of 16, which is one, and one is the same thing as 100%. Okay, so um, the question down below is what's the sum of the probabilities? It says 16 out of 16, which is one or 100%. So that's why we sort of call this a probability distribution because you're taking that total 100% probability and you're looking at all the outcomes and you're sort of distributing it amongst the outcomes. And in, prob in most cases, probabilities don't get distributed uniformly. They sort of have uneven probabilities. And you can see that here, the most probable outcome here is two, which has a 16, at, sorry, a six out of 16 probability. Um, looks like we have to compute these on our calculator. So um, one divided by 16 is 0.0625. So I'm just gonna put that in next to all this. Um, 4 out of 16 is 0.25, 6 out of 16 I'm guessing is 0.375, 4 out of 16 again 0.25, and 1 out of 16 again 0 0.0625. Okay, and uh, we want to go ahead and graph these now. So. Um, All right, so I'm just going to do the heights of the bars. This is just going to be a histogram. So the first one's 0 0.0625, about that high. Um, the next one's 0.25 right here. Next one's 0.375, going to go right about there. Then going back down to 0.25. And back down to 0 0.0625. Just a little more than halfway up on that first line. Like that. And then this is a histogram. Sorry about the noise, you guys. That's our little bar graph. It says the bars should touch. Remember histograms have touching bars and there's a reason. I'm just gonna give you guys a second to catch up. Coloring is sort of a great thing to do um, during pandemics. It sort of comforts you a little bit. So I like the color. The world is falling to pieces, but at least I have my colors. Anybody want to ask a question? No, 16 is the number of tosses. Um, so I don't know if you guys see that question by Susan. Um, when you think of outcomes, we're talking about the outcome. There's different ways of describing what the outcomes are, right? So right now it was predetermined. I already knew I was gonna toss four coins. Um, the fact is that there are 16 outcomes. That's 16 arrangements of the four coins. Um, wouldn't, why wouldn't 16 represent the number of possible outcomes? It does, okay? 16 is the number of possible outcomes. But when you say, what's 
that, and that's in the sample space. But right now, I defined x to be the number of heads. So the outcomes for heads are different for the, uh, sorry, the outcomes for the number of heads is different for just asking, well, what are the possible tosses? So I guess it just sort of depends on what do you mean by outcomes. Right now, I'm looking at the outcomes for x, which was defined as the number of heads. Okay, and in that case, there's actually five outcomes. You could get a zero, one, two, three, or a four. Does that make sense? <laughs> You're right. There are 16 individual arrangements when you drop four coins, but we're grouping some of them together. Um, the one head happens in four ways. So that's an outcome, but it's not a simple event. It's a compound event. So I think, Susan, you're thinking of, of the simple events, which are the 16 things we listed up there. When I say one head, that's a compound event that we decided could happen in four ways. Um, two heads also compound, so that happens in six ways um, out of 16. Um, I don't want to sort of overthink this. I mean, we just saw, we just listed that there were 16 outcomes up above here that I shaded in the different colors. And when I say, what's the probability of two heads, you just have to see how many of them had two H's and divide by the total number of outcomes, which was 16. Okay, and, and the only thing I'm really introducing is this weird variable X, which is counting how many heads there were. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, and and don't, don't, don't worry about this too much um, because right now we're, it's just sort of in a theoretical realm and in the end, we're gonna make this real practical. There's a question here um, about the total area of all the bars. So if you look at all these bars, um, they have a base and I'm gonna erase these notes, but the width of each bar is one. And the height of the bar is the probability. Okay, so when you do the base times the height, that's just one times the probability. So the area of the bar is the probability of the corresponding event. So for one head, the, air, the probability is, what do we say up here? Um, for one head, it's 0.25, but that's also the area of the bar. The area here is 0.25. The area is the probability, okay? So the next bar has an area of 0.375. The next one's 0.25. The last one's 0 0.0625. That's the base times the height. And the height is the probability. Okay, the first bar is also 0 0.0625. So the question that's asked down here is, um, what's the total area of all the bars combined? Anybody want to take a stab at that? I'm gonna do a little cleanup on this. Pardon me real quick. Okay, so what's the total area? Anybody do it? Yeah, total area is one. The total area is the sum of all the probabilities of x. Okay, so remember that's a Greek sigma. That means the sum of all the probabilities, which is one. 
Okay, any questions about that? Now I think in your notes you have the formula for the mean from a frequency table, which is this one here. Um, I think the only thing I would add um, is just, uh, you know, we don't use that formula very much, but we can use that formula to convert it into a, um, uh, a mean using probabilities. So if you just look at that formula, um, look what happens if you write it this way. This is the same result. If you wrote the f divided by the n like that, and then multiply by x, that's the same computation, just looks different. Okay, and when you think about f over n, that's just a relative frequency. Okay, a relative frequency is just the number of ways, number of times something happened, divided by the total number of outcomes. So f over n, that was what we did with all of these up here. One out of 16, because there was only one way, that was the frequency, one way to do it out of a total of 16 outcomes. Um, for one head, there were four out of 16 ways, so four ways to do it out of 16. Those are all relative frequencies. It's four ways divided by the total number of outcomes. So when I say f over n here, f over n is just p of x. So the mean for a probability distribution is just x times p of x. Okay, that's it. And so we'll be doing that computation in a sec. There's also a way to get a standard deviation from a probability distribution. You just kind of look at the graph. Whenever we see graphs like this, we're always saying, what's the center? Well, the center is the mean. And what's the spread? The, the spread would be the average difference the average distance from the mean, which is the standard deviation, um, which is just a measure of how wide that is. Any distribution of values has a mean and a standard deviation. And this is a distribution of probable values. We still wanna know what the mean and the standard deviation is. Um, so you can see the formula here for the mean, sorry, the standard deviation from a frequency table. And I'm just gonna rework this a little bit this way. I mean, you've got this n in the denominator. So I think I'm gonna write it as a one over n. You've got the sum of fx squared and then minus a one over n also divided by another n becomes a one over n squared sum. Oh, this is in parentheses, my bad. Sum of fx quantity squared like that. And you could rewrite this this way. Um, the sum, you could instead of having one over n, you can multiply that through with the distributive property and do f over n times x squared minus, watch what I do here, that n is being squared and the sum is being squared. So I can put it inside this way. I can do the sum of f over n x and that quantity squared like that and then remembering that f over n is just p of x that's just a probability you can finish this up by saying oh well that is just the sum of x squared times p of x minus in parentheses um, the sum of x times p of x quantity squared and then reminding you up above the sum of x times p of x is the mean of the distribution we use a mu for a population mean now and so that's the mean of the probability distribution. So I can say, oh, this is the, sum, the square root of the sum x squared p of x 
minus the sum of x p of x, that's the mean up above, squared. So that's going to be the formula for the standard deviation of a probability distribution. And I've mentioned it in passing that variance is just the square of the standard deviation. So the variance of x is sigma squared. Now it's referring us back to the coin tossing experiment that's asking for the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm just going to real quick remind you um, the formulas are here. Okay? I guess I can copy them down here. The mean is going to be the sum of x times p of x just from above and the standard deviation sum of x squared p of x minus the mean squared and the variance is sigma squared. So we have to do these computations. But I'll tell you, when you do these by hand, anytime you see one of these sums in a formula, and there are two here, you want to add those up in a table somewhere. So that's why up above, I left two built, uh, blank columns in the table. I've got an x column, a p of x column, but the mean needs a sum of x times p of x, so we need to add that up somewhere. And the standard devi deviation requires an x square p of x that has to be added up as well. Okay, so you just multiply x times p of x. So on the first one, um, x times p of x is zero times a sixteenth, which we'll just say is zero. Okay, then one times four sixteenths. Is, sorry, one times four sixteenths is four sixteenths. Okay, then two times six sixteenths is twelve sixteenths. Two times six is twelve. Okay, and then three, oops. times 4 sixteenths, that's x times p of x, is 12 sixteenths, again. Okay, and then 4 times 1 sixteenth is 4 sixteenths. Okay, so that's x times p of x. Looking to see if there's any questions about that. We've got to add them up. So 4 and 12 is 16, plus 12 is 28, plus 4 more is 32. So this thing adds up to 32 sixteenths. And I think 32 divided by 16 is 2. And I'm pausing to see if there's any questions. Okay, now um, the standard deviation requires that we do the sum of x squared times p of x. So that's the next column in the table. Just square the x and then multiply by the probability. So 0 squared is 0 times the 16th, 1 16th is still 0. 1 squared is 1 times 4 sixteenths, better be 4 sixteenths. So that's pretty easy. It gets a little more complicated now. 2 squared is 4, and 4 times 6 sixteenths, uh, 4 times 6 is 24 sixteenths. Okay, now 3 squared is 9, and 9 times 4 is 36. That's 9 times 4 sixteenths is 36 sixteenths. So these get kind of big. 
And then four squared is 16. And 16 times 1 16th is 16 times 1. 16 sixteenths. And then we need to add those up. And let's see, 4 and 24 is 28. 28 and 36 is for 64. So 16, I think, is 80 divided by 16. Anybody want to take a stab and write down what 80 divided by 16 is? Yep, 5. Thanks, Susan. Okay, so let's just denote here um, this first, the 2 was the sum of x times p of x. Um, that was 2. And then the 5 was the sum of x squared times p of x. So again, that's 5. Somebody says, why 80? Oh, well, I just counted um, how many sixteenths I had in the last column, Johnny. Um, so 4 and 24 is 28 plus 36. And that's where I did the math. 28 plus 36 is 64. And then there's another 16 eightieths. Remember, when you add fractions, you just add the numerator. So I'm adding 4. Oops, hang on. I'm adding 4 and 24 and 36 and 16 to get 80. And the denominators don't do anything when you add fractions. Johnny, you doing OK? OK. OK. So um, we've got our totals. And that's the hardest part about all of this is getting these totals. OK, so I'm going to just bring that back down here. Um, and this one and the other one. Okay, I guess I should have brought that down lower. Okay, so um, the sum of x times p of x is the mean. So the mean is two. That is a lot of work to figure out something that's absolutely obvious. If somebody says, drop four coins, what's the average number of heads? Two. No kidding. So we can go back um, to the distribution up here. And in the center of the distribution, right where the mean should be, is mu the center of the distribution? Okay, totally obvious, but this also works in cases where the numbers are messy and it's not obvious, and that's really what's more important here. Okay, any questions? All right, um, next, um, the standard deviation. So we have to do the square root of the sum of x squared p of x. That's this guy over here I just circled. Okay, so x squared p of x, that's just a five. Oops, just a five minus the mean. Okay, the mean was two. So it's five minus four. That's easy. 1 minus 4 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So the standard deviation is 1. So the mean is 2, and the average distance from the mean is 1. Perfect. Variance is the standard deviation squared, so this will be 1 squared. So the variance is 1. Variance is important in the next section of the material. Okay, what's next here? Yeah, okay, I'm just waiting to see if anybody's got questions right now.
Sorry, this is off topic. Go. Um, I'm not sure that our week that we are one be week behind. Um, but I am sure that I really can't do the test next week because right now um, attendance is optional uh, and it's not going to be required. So the test was supposed to be next week, um, but the campus is still, you know, closed next week. So right now um, I'm requiring that you at least watch these lectures, but it's just a homework thing. You don't have to attend to the lectures, but the material is still required. I don't think I can test you next week. So I think we're going to push the test a week back. So what does that mean? I'm looking at my calendar real quick here. Um, so the test is scheduled for the 27th. And I guess it's going to have to be April 3rd, right? Does that sound about right, you guys? OK, we'll do April 3rd. But I'm just going to cover. Mm, yeah, probably cover whatever we get to next time. Okay, you guys okay? So we'll say April 3rd. Okay, Brian? No, I don't think we'll be taking it in class um, unless a miracle happens, you know, and all of a sudden <laughs> everybody's better in terms of the virus. So, um, I, I think it's safe to say we're going to be doing an online test and it'll be at 8.30 a.m. on Friday in two weeks. Okay, and um, I haven't figured out exactly, I think a bunch of it's going to be multiple choice because, you know, chapter one was all definitions and stuff. Um, no, almost no computations in chapter one. So I think, I think it makes sense. Um, to do an online test that will be mostly multiple choice and then you'll have some computations and obviously that won't be multiple choice. What? Why sheesh? What's up, Andrea? Why sheesh? Oh my goodness. If you're gonna say sheesh, you have to say why. I won't be mad. Andrea, I see that, Brian, I'm waiting for Andrea. I think she could be unmuted. What if I unmute her? Andrea, why sheesh? <laughs> I don't know, everything's so crazy. <laughs> That's all you got? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, like we were open and then like kind of open and now it's like completely shut down. Yeah, I know. I think all the people in charge are just faking it right now. Is that safe to say? Yeah. <laughs> all right, we're gonna, but um, <laughs> sure, I'm, sure I'll, I'm sure I'll have questions when I go back to do the homework. Will there be office hours? Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to office hours next week. Um, even though technically we'll be closed, what I'll do is, hmm. <laughs> I think I'm going to have you guys email me if you like to me to meet during office hours. So I'll post this um, in Canvas. If you want to do a face-to-face -face office hour, we'll do it through Zoom or something like that. And probably Zoom's the best. But I'm not going to sit there waiting if nobody emails me um, next week. But I think the following week I have next week campus is closed, so I don't. They're not, they're not asking us to do stuff like this, but I'm going to go ahead and let you guys contact me if you want office hours. And then when you do, then I'll say, okay, will, will today's office hour be okay? And I'm just going to use the normal office hours that are in the syllabus. But if you need another time, then just let me know. Okay, I'm, I'm at home all the time right now, except for I'm giving some lectures now and then. So um, it'll be a lot more busy week after next. But next week is wide open. Um, just I'm only teaching two classes um, next week, and then the following week I'll be back up to four classes. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, but I have no problem with this online thing. That's great. Good for you, Andrea. Um, Brian's asking about a review session. And so I'm going to talk about that. Let me, you guys, let me finish this lecture. <laughs> and um, I'll uh, show you where the review is. But again, it's going to be two weeks. There will absolutely be a review. And there is a review. It's already posted, as a matter of fact. I'll show you where that is. And I'll put it on Canvas. OK, so um, going back to the next page, I just want to summarize what we've got here. So the first thing is um, that the sum, sorry, that the probability of x is always between 0 and 1. This is just a summary of everything for this lesson. So I'll say for all x, the probability is between 0 and 1. Um, the next thing we figured out is that the sum of the probabilities is one. So that you have this sort of, that's your pie and you slice it up and the way you hand out the probabilities to the different events is how you're distributing the probabilities. It's a probability distribution. Um, then I could, I think the next one was that the mean is also called expected value. Now it gets a new name. Okay. Um, it's also denoted E of X. So these are all different ways of saying the mean. Okay. The mean is the expected value of the variable X. Okay. And then the formula is as we've used already. It's the sum of X times P of X. Like that. And then the standard deviation is sigma. Okay. Sigma doesn't have a special notation. It's just the standard deviation. And so the formula is as it was, sum of x squared p of x minus the mean squared, like that. So standard deviation. I'll make some more notes into this. So the mean um, expected value is also known as the mean. Okay. And then finally, um, sigma squared is variance. And you will see in the next lesson uh, why this is important. Right now, it's just the square standard deviation. But we denote, it, it's so important, it gets a weird notation, var x. The variance of the random variable x is how I would say that. OK. And I was supposed to cover one more lesson. So that puts us one section. Somebody said we were a week behind. We're only one section behind. Um, if you look at the, uh, the schedule. So um, today I was supposed to do, this was 5.1. Today I was also supposed to do 5.2. But we'll do that next Wednesday. Sorry, next Friday. Okay, so I'm going to turn the recording off.